respective chiefs, uh, IONS members, and honorable uh, delegates. What I would like to do in, in my presentation is to provide with the link between what's been discussed uh, earlier today in this session and what uh, we intend to follow up um, um, uh, tomorrow morning. Effectively, when it comes to understanding problems of energy security in the Indian Ocean, um, you, you heard it a, a lot uh, earlier today about opportunities versus challenges, and I think that's precisely what we need to consider with respect to understanding um, the Indian Ocean in terms of not just the theater of operations, but also in terms of area of potential exploration and development. It is an area that is of uh, uh, imperative importance uh, for the global and regional community given the sheer size, the extent of the area. Also, unfortunately, that is an area that continues to see uh, regional contest, uh, power competition, instability, and in insecurity. And this is obviously an important element to take into consideration with respect to understanding uh, the Indian Ocean growing, uh, growing prominence as, as not just the vital strategic corridor that you heard about, and I'm sure you all are uh, quite familiar about this, but also as an area of um, uh, developing um, uh, production of uh, critical energy supplies for which uh, members of the Indian Ocean community and the broader in the Pacific community uh, aspire uh, um, uh, uh, to get more and more every, um, every year. Obviously something that uh, everyone is familiar with that uh, we tend to consider the Indian Ocean as a part of the global strategic link that connects it uh, with another maritime theater with clientele in, um, in East Asia, in North America, in other parts of the world. Uh, there's been references to critical um, uh, strategic shock points, uh, a disruption of which uh, would uh, um, uh, challenge, even compromise uh, global strategic trade. Uh, certainly that's all elements uh, 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 that are attributed to the energy security with respect to the Indian Ocean. Um, but also it is an area where we see more and more exploration taking place with respect to uh, the actual extraction of the resources, not just the shipment of resources. And with this, with this respect, we need to take into account and, and, and consider uh, how the Indian Ocean features within the global energy community. There are a number of um, states that are effectively dependent on the steady supplies of, um, of the energy resources, and, and, and quite a few of them are located within the um, um, Indian Ocean region. There are also states that actually try to offset uh, that demand by offering their, their services, their pro uh, products, their commodities uh, to those who are in need. Um, uh, that certainly includes Australia, that includes Gulf states, um, Indonesia, um, and as well as other countries. Uh, with respect to, to, to shipments of, uh, of this uh, area, and I think this is where we need to look at the problem of energy security with respect to the Indian Ocean as a two as a two-dimensional problem. One is um, the, the capacity of the area to provide uh, access to energy resources, um, and then obviously the opportunity to transit them uh, from. Uh, and, and, and certainly uh, the, the global, uh, not just regional, dependence on, on, on the security and stability of this area, which is obviously one of the fundamental um, features of, of, this, um, of this seminar. Um, what we haven't seen before and what's becoming a more and more important feature, uh, a, a more prominent feature uh, today is the, the area in itself is opening opportunities not just for the transit of uh, uh, strategic energy resources and raw materials, but also as an area where you see the exploration and extraction of these materials. Um, leave it alone. Um, uh, traditional areas which are affiliated with the exploration of these resources, which would be the Gulf. Um, uh, there's been, um, as well as the Bay of Bengal, for example, um, uh, or Western Australia, and we need to remember that, uh, the, uh, that having, having this discussion here on the Western seaboard of Australia uh, provides also with a prime example on, on what this area delivers to us in terms of onshore and offshore exploration and the potential that uh, that it has. 
Uh, but uh, it's not just on the western seaboard of the Indian Ocean, but uh, similar, um, similar opportunities exist on the eastern seaboard of the Indian Ocean, particularly around the littoral of the African continent. There's been quite a bit of a discussion and about uh, the potential uh, surrounds um, exploration opportunities uh, around Somalia Basin, uh, uh, around Tanzania, Mad Madagascar, and, uh, and other areas. But it all comes down to not just understanding what's, uh, what's buried underneath and how to, to get access to it, and obviously with um, um, continuous technological innovation, it becomes less and less of a costly exercise and more commercially driven exercise, but also how to ensure that these operations uh, remain stable and uh, profitable and mutually beneficial for the uh, regional players involved as well as for the operators and, and, and providers of, of technology that would um, engage in, in such operations. And certainly one of the key benefits of engaging in, um, uh, in resource exploration in this part of the world is uh, it provides you with um, um, uh, um, these operations obviously open your opportunities to, to run them in proximity to clientele. So obviously energy hungry countries um, are also located in Asia, in East Asia, and obviously by um, um, setting up operations to extract resources closer to the, to the shores, reduces transit time, reduces any risks um, uh, linked to uh, pressures that may be applying to critical lines of supply um, uh, in, in, in transit and obviously reduces transit costs as well. And that brings to another point, uh, obviously ma ma many references to, to shock, um, uh, shock points, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more about them tomorrow, and also potential pressures and outcomes that may fall out from, um, uh, from anything that may happen around those areas because of their criticality, specifically with respect to the e export of energy resources. I give you one example that there's been quite a few questions raised at the time when there's going, there was a political transition occurring in Egypt about sustainability, strategic sustainability of, of the Suez Canal. Nothing to do with maritime terrorism, nothing to do with power, state power competition and their impact on, um, on um, uh, the maritime security regime. Uh, a land-based security situation, a political change uh, that got operators thinking about what else can fall out from, uh, from that particular situation. So in this sense, uh, developments on land, not just at sea, can also have an uh, impact or even, even provide a certain perception to, to the commercial providers and operators and make them feel um, um, uh, or make not just uncomfortable but make them uh, question uh, the whole uh, essence of uh, what I would describe as strategic sustainability, specifically with respect, respect to their business continuity planning, which brings to another point. Um, uh, there is an array of challenges, and uh, some of them has been discussed, so I'm not going to go in detail of that with respect to the Indian Ocean, and we should really be looking at the combination of them, not just asymmetric, but also state-driven threats. Also to point out, and that's my personal perspective, that the Indian Ocean sees something that we only have seen uh, during the Cold War, the deployment of nuclear weapons at sea. Um, once again, one can question how, what's that to do with uh, um, offshore oil and gas exploration uh, and the transport of critical energy supplies, but we need to understand that this is an area where we see ongoing power contests of uh, regional players, external players, uh, but certainly from the point of utilizing opportunities that exist in the area along the African coast, along South Asian, Southeast Asian coast, the question of effective police and effective control of maritime borders and more importantly exclu exclusive economic zones for commercial operators when they develop their long-term strategies, where they develop um, business continuity planning um, is something that becomes an, an, an issue of, of strategic significance. And, and certainly we in Australia understand it uh, uh, considerably given the fact that one third of our exclusive economic zone is in this um, zone, uh, the, the Indian Ocean um, area. So the question of energy security, the question of uh, uh, stable uh, 
development uh, and, and strategic sustainability with respect to energy supplies in this part of the world can also be directly linked to the question of uh, effective border police and protection um, also with uh, extending it into, uh, into um, uh, state's capability to, to function within AZ. And, and obviously this is something that's been reflected um, in, um, in, um, in Australian strategic planning context and here I'm representing my views, I'm not speaking on behalf of any organization or, or, or a government where obviously uh, the area has been identified as an area of, of growing importance with respect to energy security, um, just like in the context that this is all happening against uh, growing um, regional as well as uh, external involvement in, uh, in the maritime uh, security affairs uh, with respect to uh, uh, this part of the world. And certainly some ongoing challenges that continue to, to shape the, the regional uh, security environment have been noticed, particularly with respect to the power competition between the two principal uh, players um, uh, in, in certainly in the central part of the Indian Ocean, though uh, uh, the, the, the risk assessment has, as you see from um, extractions from the two defense white papers that's been um, uh, produced here in Australia has somehow been uh, downgraded. The fact of maritime terrorism that probably referred to and was also made references before uh, should also be taken into account. Um, here I just give you an extract from um, Al-Qaeda produced magazine. You may want to ask me why we're talking about Al-Qaeda in 2014. Obviously, in this sense, we shouldn't be thinking of Al-Qaeda as a, as a capable, as a potent actor rather than Al-Qaeda inspired ideas that may give um, inspiration to like-minded organizations, network, or even opportunistic um, uh, groups. They may want to utilize knowledge and as, as well as seize on the opportunity. Uh, possible risks with respect to not just sea-based or, or offshore facilities, but also onshore facilities. There were a number of incidents um, occurring, for example, in, in Saudi Arabia, specifically when uh, uh, the energy uh, um, uh, production and supply chain was targeted, leave alone uh, the incident with MV Limbeck in 2002, continue to point out that there is definitely a risk of, um, of a deliberate attack on, 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 those, um, on those assets. And, and certainly when we talk about potential explore exploration in high risk areas like Somalia, this is something that needs to be taken into consideration, whatever the motives uh, are going to be. There is another element that I would like to draw attention to, honorable guests, um, that's something that we don't really discuss quite often with, with respect to uh, security challenges. And I'm using the example of an incident that occurred um, um, uh, in September last year in the land far, far away from uh, the part of the world that we're discussing now in the Barents Sea. Uh, when um, a group of political activists, uh, I'm sure you all heard about this because Russians know how to make international news and certainly when they're trying to negotiate their challenge, they, they knew how to draw international attention. Um, but uh, from the security perspective, from the, uh, from the perspective on the understanding challenges, the attack on, on the pre uh, uh offshore facilities, which was a well-coordinated, uh, multi-staged attack, which also involved a hardline response, highlighted another problem, the problem of political activism, something that kind of takes us outside the box of traditional perceptions with respect to identifying um, uh, threats. Uh, again, this is something that is a, is a more of a common issue in Europe, in Americas, in Eurasia, uh, but also something that uh, may, be, um, uh, may become an issue later on in our part of the world, given the fact that uh, environmental groups uh, that uh, often resort to uh, violent acts um, on the high seas uh, are global in their nature of operations, and they may consider uh, um, uh, similar actions um, uh, in, 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 uh, in the Indian Ocean region as well, as, as well as this, uh, just like with this accident, incident that has occurred, it can also demonstrate um, high impact of those uh, activities 
in terms of media attention, media coverage, as well as mitigations that government, government agencies have to go through in order to justify the actions if they're taking the approach that the Russians took. So, in conclusion, um, um, certainly with respect to understanding the Indian notion uh, from uh, the point of exploration, development, and sustainment um, of energy resources, this is an area of growing prominence. There is no doubt about that. Also because um, when we talk about traditional areas where energy resources have been exploited and extracted, we have to be realistic and take into account that all sort of political cataclysms that occur in, in for example, throughout Eurasia, in, in Europe, uh, in the Middle East, uh, may also want uh, uh, countries that dependent on energy resources seek alternative. And in this sense, the Indian Ocean provides uh, with a competitive al al alternative. And obviously, there are definitely un underdeveloped and unexplored opportunities to turn this area into the second Gulf. Um, but we certainly have to take this into account when there are opportunities, there are also challenges. And certainly one of the most immediate challenge to any operations, commercial operations um, in the littoral would be uh, a risk posed by organized crime, um, uh, we, um, whether it's, it's terrorism, which can be regarded as a form of organized crime, uh, risk uh, posed by NGOs, which may exercise politically motivated violence uh, driven by different agendas um, uh, that may have an impact on the security um, uh, and then to an extent compromise, potentially compromise uh, these operations. But we also need to take account that the security environment is evolving. We may see a different uh, threat scenarios emerging um, over the next um, uh, uh, two to three years. And obviously this is something that need to be taken into account. What we are planning for today might not necessarily be relevant tomorrow. And we obviously, in terms of undertaking strategic forecasting, we have to basically understand that this is a continuous evolving threat. Um, the importance of the energy security is critical to us and we obviously have to look be over the horizon um, in order to ensure that um, uh, our, our demand for energy um, is met with a steady supply. Thank you very much.